This video is sponsored by Ground Branch, the uncompromising thinking man's FPS from one of the developers behind the original Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon games. Live out your tactical fantasy through eight player co-op multiplayer, complete with proximity chat and in-depth character and weapon customization. Don't have seven friends to play with? Well, head on down to your local grocery store and start asking strangers in the produce aisle. Also, while you're there, please check to see if the heirloom tomatoes are still on sale. Those juicy little guys are so delicious. <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. Ground Branch is here to put the tactical back into Tactical Shooter, and the big version 1034 update makes the experience even better thanks to map improvements, additional playable characters, and the new prone stance. So what are you waiting for? Start shouting things like Breach, Suppressing Fire, and I've Got Your Six to all your new Produce Isle pals today in Ground Branch, available now on Steam in Early Access. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Windbreaker Podcast. I'm Yatsu Crowshaw. I'm joined by uh, Marty and Frost. Hello. Oh, it's me. Hey, and, and this week, we're talking about something that I think is an important learned skill for a lot of people, especially in journalism. Identifying the enormous flaws in the things we otherwise really like. I think there's a tendency when you really like something to sort of make it part of your identity, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of uh, uh if you don't like keep this sort of thing in check you end up jumping all over someone's butt because they didn't like something you liked like the like the experience i had with the dragon's dogma 2 community in recent times huh. yeah and the worst thing and you could even get to where it's like i like the thing but i don't like the thing enough and you're like what are we doing here like this is yeah. this is absurd yeah, I'm more of a of a, a fair weather fan where it's like, oh, this game goaded second, third, great, fourth fell off, washed, I'm done. I'm like, I don't take <laughs> that on people. I'm yeah. just like, wow, oh, this is disappointing. <laughs> I think it's a virtue to be a fair weather fan. I think oh. it's uh, it's I think it's on the entertainers to entertain us. It's not on us to be loyal. Oh God, we've outnumbered you, Marty. Oh no, oh, so what's happening? <laughs> so with all that in mind. Uh, we're going to talk about our favorite games and the one thing or more in those games that we really can't stand. Now, who wants to throw me out something that they probably assume I'm going to bring up at some point in this podcast? Dark Souls. Oh, good one. Or uh, anything from da Soft adjacent, yeah. I, I, I think specifically like Dark, Dark Souls. Souls 1. You're going to say how yeah. obtuse it was at the start? No. No. What I'm going to say the is third that, of the game, like every FromSoft game. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks for thanks for spoiling <laughs> it, asshole. Dude, sorry, sorry, we were guessing. Yeah, well, I thought this was. I think All right. Dark Souls has really great level design because it designs itself around the fact that you don't have fast travel, and then guess what? It gives you fast travel, and all the level design after that goes pretty severely downhill. Mm-hmm. I mean, it does, you get that you get that feeling that the last third of that game is rushed, right? You get the feeling yeah, that they're yeah. like, oh, we need to hit this deadline." And listen, uh, Miyazaki's too busy; uh, he's already thinking about Bloodborne. So let's just let's just wrap up this fucking Lost, yeah. Lost Isolith. Let's just toss oh, people yes. down here. Let's just reuse some of those bosses. It's fine. If I were to encapsulate it, Lost Isolith, yeah, the the Nadia of Dark Souls. I mean, mm -hmm. it starts okay. Nice intro, all full of red lava caverns, uh, the uh, uh, copious discharge, whatever his name is. Fine. <laughs> Jesus. But then you get down to Lost Isolith itself. There's lots of copy-pasted monster butts running around. You, mm -hmm. There's no real level design except you have to run across some lava at some point. And uh, fucking Bed of Chaos. Yeah. To, get, to use its full title, The Fucking Bed of Chaos. Oh, uh, Junior. <laughs> Oh. Nice little fuck bed. It's funny because I also think like I, I think Dark Souls plays its uh, plays its uh, weaknesses uh, a little bit earlier uh, for a bit as well with um, the Capra Demon. That boss fight mm. is I think like genuinely bad. That oh, like might be one of the worst boss fights. Capra Demon. It's the one in the closet. The tiny, the tiny yeah, the tiny okay. little the tiny little garden with two two dog yeah. fuckers who come at you right away. I, like I that, find. That. 
Given practice, he doesn't give me any trouble anymore. You just know to, as long as you can get past the dogs and up the stairs, then you're pretty much sorted. But it's like a real shit way to fight to just like, I'm going to go up the stairs, cheese you with a hit, get, get you with the stairs. Fight. Like, I don't know. It just, it feels like so many of the boss fights in the game have an elegance to them, and that just lacks that elegance. Elegance, my ass. The double standard, where they'd be clipping through everything. <laughs> Meanwhile, I go for a swing and immediately cling, like, Come on. Sounds like that sounds very elegant to me. Well, all right. The elegance of the symphony that is coming yeah. off my sword yeah. is clanging away. Well, yeah. Well, mm. you have to remember you're the one with the advantage here. You can mm -hmm. go back as many times as you want every time you yeah. die. The yeah, energies, right? I can unplug this game. That's what I can yeah. do. <laughs> there you go. You can, you can just stop. Yeah. Uh, sticking with uh, sticking with FromSoft, uh, I mean, we, we joked, obviously, about how a lot of their endings kind of are feel lacking uh, to us. I would say the same thing about uh, Elden Ring, kind of all the stuff. Farmazulia, uh, Farmazula is like a really cool place, and then everything after yeah. that is kind of boring in my mind. Uh, but uh, for Bloodborne, I, I do fundamentally think the blood vials are a major problem in that game until you get really good at it, and it Absolutely, just seems like it yeah. punishes you for wanting to get better, which is yeah. a really shitty mechanic anytime a game uses that. You run out, you have to go back and grind up blood vials in like an earlier, easier part of the game, and I hate that shit. Yeah. yeah, so makes you play more like big, timid. Yeah, another victim of from software end of game syndrome. I mean, what's all with what's with all that eating umbilical cords business? It's delicious. You just need, you need the mother blood. Yeah. It's all about that mother blood. Down. No. <laughs> um, but I've, I did, I take the philosophy that from software games are about the journey rather than the destination because the ending cinematics almost universally kind of suck. What? Times it's like well, everything's gonna stay the same or everything's gonna be different. Who knows? Did you not see the what was it that that screaming fucking eldritch beast at the end of Bloodborne? That's a callback to me to Kojima when the horse screams out in Metal Gear Solid. Did you not get that? I made a video once of that. It's the exact same thing. White field. You kill the boss and then the horse comes over and no, <laughs> it's a very sad horse. It's the exact right. same thing. You're saying the horse is the same as the moon presence in Bloodborne? No, it's just it's just a shout out to him because there was an interview Miyazaki did once where he says, "I love meeting these CEOs and executives because then I design bosses of like that is, that is them." And then everyone was like, "Who's Kojima?" And I'm like, "I'm pretty sure it was his Eldritch little beast thing because that's the exact horse scene." Like, uh, I, I don't know if uh, oh, there he is. Yeah, yeah, Eric's doing it kind of. Well, going. anyway, let's. I have a feeling we're going to have a lot to get through on this one. So, yeah. Matty, I nominate Persona 5. Oh, my God. Uh, specifically Persona 5 Royal, what they did to the Okumura boss fight. It is the only fight in the game that when I reach it, I'm like, is there just a, can I put this on the easiest of easy modes? And the problem is on easy mode, the boss fight is even harder because uh, what it ends up doing is putting... Uh, you have to fight waves and waves of his minions, but you have to kill yeah. the minions in like a single turn or else the minions explode yes. and then come back. Um, yes, I hate that fucking fight. That's the one fight I had to look up a walkthrough for to get some like hints you on don't how use to almost like it. specific attacks and specific elements at different phases. And it's, it's yeah. uh, incredibly, incredibly frustrating. I will also say a persona problem that is more so on replays once you like really know the games um i noticed in like the last month of persona 3 reload uh, like the last calendar month of the game i had kind of done everything and mm. so i just had to wait till the end of the month and i had my stats were all up all of the people i could hang out with were gone like yeah. i'd either max them out or they were gone i'd already dated everyone and so I'm, at this point i'm just like I have nothing to do during the days, so I've, it's just like being depressed in January, which I guess yeah, is kind of real. Yeah, I haven't, got anywhere near, I haven't got anywhere near the end of Persona 3 Reload. I've maxed out all my stats. Because there's only three. Yeah, there's only three, and, and you get them for doing a lot of, a lot of things. So that, yeah. that almost feels like, I think by and the I was, time yeah, they got I was to following Royal, the usual. I was following the usual Persona philosophy of trying to keep your stats up with everything you, you do. So I was yeah. eating the fucking place that makes your face greasy a lot. Yeah. And mm. uh, I almost had to maxed out. Yeah, I, I haven't need, even like unlocked the friendship tracks with the party members yet. They need to. Uh, uh, they they need to incorporate the GTA three thing of if you keep eating at the burger place, your character gets fat. Can you not? Well, That's a fable thing. Character. No, 
Can't. That's a GTA San Andreas did. thing, isn't it? San Andreas, that's what I meant, not three. I meant three, oh. three. <laughs> you <laughs> can do that in Fable, three. get fat on pie. Yeah. I love getting yeah, fat yeah. on pie. You, you yeah, yeah. You could certainly do that in Fable. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, as much as I love Persona, that is, uh, those, those are two things that, uh, two, two nits I like picking. All right, here's a question for you. What's the creepiest character to romance in every Persona game? Uh, anyone who's like Futaba in five, I would say, just because there's yes. kind of like a surrogate younger sister vibe yes. to that. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, younger sister characters, I feel. Um, I don't think anyone's creepy in three. There's only like a handful of options. I think romancing a robot's kind of weird in its own way. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, correct. I mean, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on there. There's a, you know, there's a power differential there because she's programmed to like you. Yeah, and it's a little thing like my whole like prime directive is to protect you. And I'm like, okay, well, do you have any interests that aren't me? You seem to like gardening. Can you do that without me? Yeah. Like, got some hobbies, some friends. Uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, the fuck bot thing's a little weird. Don't, Is that your main complaint of Persona? They're all so needy. Yeah, I want people to be hanging out and be like, oh, you, I won't hang out with you tonight because I'm hanging out with two other people. Like, I like that idea. Have your own friends. Play hard to get. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice if you could hang out with more than one person at a time and up both your relationships at a time. Yeah. In, more, more often in Persona games. Yeah. Mm. Frost, I don't think I actually know this. What's your favorite game? There you go. I mean, probably Binding of Isaac. Binding of Isaac? Mm-hmm. And Game Maker's Toolkit had pretty much spot on on the thing that still haunts uh, the developers to this day is that they made the game super obtuse. They're like, we want you guys to find different combinations of items and then tell each other how it went and then experiment some more. And he says, that's something. And it's like uh, people would play with wikis up. They would see what the items could do because it wouldn't tell you in the game. So when they made the port, uh, with the, I believe it was Nicholas, he asked, can you make the most popular mod, the one that tells you what the items do, can you make that a standard of the game? I was like, yeah, because rogues are so obtuse and they think it's fun where I, because, oh, the old ones didn't tell you what the game did. It's because the old ones came with manuals. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like it's sort of like a Metroid brainier, isn't it? You're supposed to play it over and over again and figure out its secrets. There's so, but there's so, but the gameplay is so, this is so emergent. There's so many items. It's just not feasible. So you're going to end up writing yeah. it down, you know? It's like Tunic, it's, how you got to draw on the map. You know, for a roguelike, you're not going to write all these down. Does, uh, does Binding, I, I've, I've barely played Binding of Isaac. Does it keep track of things when you learn them? Or is no. it? Not the old, no, Okay, the old so one. it's one of those things where it's like uh, the onus is on yeah. the player to yeah. not only know these things, but remember these things and be able to call back to these things. Exactly. Yeah, and so, it's certainly uh, gotten a bit bloated with all the extra versions and extra content updates it's had over the years. I mean, is it possible for a game not to get a bit bloated if it keeps getting updated, right? But, well, like, then it, but then it's fine well, if it's bloated. It's just your information system now needs a rework, yeah. which, which it got. Well, this gets me to the next game I was going to bring up, actually, which is Stardew, Stardew Valley. Hmm. It's so one of my favorite games just to play, like with a podcast on in the background. I love like managing a farm, uh, and the the new content updates gave me an excuse to uh, try it out again to get to the new content. But what I'm finding, having gotten to it in my most recent playthrough, is that I don't really care. Like I never played it like uh, since it got the the uh, the tropical islands content, right? Uh, and I got to that bit, and I got to that bit that's like after I'd, you know, saved the community and all that, and, and uh, uh, unlocked the boat that takes you to the tropical island. And I got there, and I walked around it once, and I was like, I don't want to do this. I want to tend my farm. I want to do all the... I want to, like, do stuff that helps me uh, help re like construct the life I am building with Shane and my two kids. This yeah. just feels like a whole, like, separate thing that's been bolted onto the side of the game that I don't particularly want to engage with. Yeah, there's we we you see that a lot with games and we've actually seen that a lot with games this year whether it's the uh latest like a dragon although that's kind of been a yakuza thing forever or even uh with Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth which uh, will be your fully ramblematic this week but uh mm. like at a certain point does having more we all okay more obviously isn't better. But does having more yeah. even if you don't need to do it does that 
can that ruin an experience? Like, even if it's just there, does knowing it's there kind of like ruin or like dilute the thing for you? Mm. I think more can certainly have a diluting effect. That's any of the effects I'm feeling from the Stardew Valley stuff. Yeah. You know, it makes me think of web comics that have run since 1997 and that started as like a shitty slice of life teenagers who go to a yeah. coffee shop thing mentioning their names and then like now it's it's set in space and uh, half the mm. characters are robots and half the characters are aliens and there was no like like noticeable point where it transitioned along the course of things it just feels like at a certain point stop this and make something new you want to do something new that's great i mean joss whedon didn't launch buffy the vampire slayer into space when he wanted to make firefly he yeah. stopped making buffy and he made firefly instead Rice, you just hit on like my old favorite franchises of like as they're shifting and shifting. It's like, but we have to keep the IP. It's like, no, you could have just made something different. <laughs> All you got to do is make something new. Um, yeah, I mean, that's you see that problem a lot with old TV shows too, when they had to stick to like the 20 to 25 episode seasons. Like at a certain point, if you've done 200 episodes of a show, you're going to start reusing ideas or shit's going to get kind of dumb. Uh, like I, when I was rewatching the X-Files, I'm like, oh, you are just now redoing episodes from earlier in the series. Like the mm. same sort of core concept of like, oh, no, Mulder swap bodies with someone else and Scully might fuck doppelganger Mulder. Like, I'm like you did this Again, several like... times on this show. How did this happen? Uh, <laughs> at a certain <laughs> point, you got to learn from those yeah. mistakes. <laughs> I think that's a result of the American way of making TV shows where it has to be like 24 episodes to a yeah, season. Yeah, yeah. At least how it, was, it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. What if they genuinely just think, like, I can do it better this time, though. Hold on. Let me do it. Let me try this again. I mean, honestly, you can just start re-reviewing all of this. Just go back to uh, 2007 or whatever year you started this and just re-review all the games. Just play them again. Honestly, yeah, I feel like I, I could probably get away with that, honestly. Yeah. People I think it'd kind of be fascinating to see, like, well, how have you changed in Close to 20 years. How has your opinion changed on things? Yeah. Well, when it comes to Final Fantasy, not a whole bunch, turns out. <laughs> Tragic. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to. Yeah, I what's another? I guess back to you. Uh, did you have any for Silent Hill 2? I guess. Out of Silent, Silent Hill 2, one of my f most favoritest horror games of all time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I could certainly uh, point to a couple of problems there. I think the inventory puzzles in those games are really, really dumb. <laughs> and there's a system Silent Hill 2 uses for combining inventory items, mm -hmm. which is similarly very, very dumb. Yeah. The, like, uh, the old adventure games of the 90s had this down pat. You click on one inventory item, then you click on the other inventory item. Bam. Easy peasy. In Silent Hill 2, you get to the place where you have to solve the puzzle, and then instead of combining inventory items, you just like put all the ones you want to use to solve this puzzle in a list without mm. any real understanding of how you intend to use any of them. Ew. Like, there's a, there's a puzzle with a trap door you have to open, and how you solve it is you use a wax doll, a lighter, and a, a horseshoe on it. Where's if you it use any other combination of those items, or only one of those items, the game just went, No! No! Doesn't work. Try again. But you've got to specifically use all those three items at the same time, to solve the puzzle it's it's the, it's not good that specific puzzle i don't know i can't tell you if i would have been able to solve it or not because we talked about the puzzle like a week or two before i was replaying the game and so when i got to it i was like ah here was the really dumb puzzle yazi brought up and i did it in my mind i'm like there's no way i would have put any of this together if you had not have said that i just would have got frustrated and just looked up a guide and be like what the, what, what the fuck do i do with this horse hair horseshoe yeah. not horse hair this horse hair it's a lot of horse hair everywhere. At least that game doesn't respawn baddies. Imagine if it respawned yeah. baddies as you were running back and forth across the map trying to figure this shit out. Yeah. Mm. It's funny because at the same time, Resident Evil has you combining items and they make sense, right? It would be like, here's a, here's a jewelry box with an indentation for something in it. And then you combine it with an emerald that mm. looks like it would fit in there. And then it opens the box or whatever. Um, that at least has like a tangible... It exists in like the real world, whereas that stuff just feels incredibly obtuse. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember it ever being a problem playing Resident Evil games. I guess it was always yeah. pretty intuitive. Yeah, mm. agreed. So that's Silent Hill Two. Uh, what's another yeah. one you like, Marty? 
I have a couple for Zelda in general, just to catch all okay. Zelda. It's one of my favorite uh, franchises. Um, there's there's some uh, mine like aren't too outlandish in terms of I think most people would agree with certain ones. Going back to Ocarina of Time, the Water Temple is notoriously uh, people say is one of the worst temples of all time. I do not think it is because of the design of the Water Temple. I think it is because on the Super Nintendo or on the N64 where it originally debuted, the uh, the main thing of the Water Temple is you have to put on and take off these iron boots that either like so you can sink to the bottom and walk on the ground or you can swim normally and you can't attach those to like one of the three item slots you have to go into the menu and equip them and then go into the menu and unequip them so it turns this dungeon which is actually kind of smart that one thing about it makes navigating the dungeon like an absolute chore like an absolute pain in the ass and they did fix it in the 3ds version which i think is yeah. them realizing that like oh that's like yeah. a major flaw in an otherwise pretty great game the well, first time I played through, fixed. first time I played through Ocarina of Time was in was uh, on the 3DS version, and I remember getting through the water dungeon and thinking, "Well, what was all the fuss about that?" Yeah, the fix was they uh, you could uh, assign the iron boots just as like a regular item that you would use just with one yeah. of the buttons, like one of the face buttons. So you could just put it on and off at the tap of a button, as opposed to going into the menu, tabbing over, unequipping it, and then leaving the menu. Right, we thought that, that would be fun. I, I just didn't know, was, right? Yeah. Like. It's like the. I want to say they frontier. also added some like uh, guidance to the environment design. I think. I think so. Yeah, kind of, they they do sort of some things with uh, lighting and color to make the dungeons a little more uh, readable, yeah. especially their puzzles. Uh, Wind Waker has again. I feel like Nintendo knows the worst parts of their games because they tend to go back and fix them when they do redos. And Wind Waker, the Triforce quest in the last third of the game, is kind of obnoxious in the GameCube version. And then the Wii U version, it's been really streamlined and simplified. Yes, because in the original version, there was a lot of middle mining. Like, mm-hmm. you'd have to... Uh, you'd have to, like, recover buried treasure from the bottom of the ocean, and the buried treasure would be a map, and the map would lead you to a place where you'd find the part. I think in the remake, they switched it so the map was just the part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, instead of... Yeah, like you said, taking out the middleman, because there's no reason for that. Yeah, they also uh, and added, then, the, how, what did you think about uh, the fact that they added a sail that automatically changes the wind in the remake? <laughs> I th- I think I like it because it it makes the game more playable. That said, there's certain elements in these Zelda games where like I think the friction is important. Uh, mm. Breath of the Wild, one of the things that I hate, like I, I'm fine with weapon degradation actually, is how often it'll randomly start raining. And then the, the game is about climbing, and then you just can't climb. And so yeah. you're just like, well, I guess I just wait until it's not raining. I'll just go to bed for 12 hours and wake up and see if it's not raining. Um, same thing with like the, the, the wind and the sails and stuff in, in Wind Waker. I, like, I appreciate them, like the chutzpah of putting that stuff in, but uh, ultimately I just think it, is, it, it hampers the fun. And so removing it is probably good for the game. Well, you have to, it has to feel Question like an adventure. I, I never minded the long traversal in Wind Waker because, I, you know, the sense of crossing the ocean always lent the game a very uh, dynamic, epic feel for me. And kind of distinct. Like, that's there's there's not a lot of games at that scale that have that kind of, like, seafaring sense of adventure. And the game is really good at that. And so does streamlining that remove some of that? Does it make it just... I mean, in many ways, like, having to fiddle with wind direction is, like, analogous to having to fix up your car in Pacific Drive, for example. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's part of the game. It's You do the little fiddly bit so you can enjoy the bit where you're, like, uh, putting your foot down trying to escape from a collapsing reality. Yeah. yeah. In Pacific Drive. I mean, not Zelda Wind Waker. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, <right. laughs> Put your, uh, put your foot down on the King of Red Lions and he won't oh be no. very happy about that. Oh mm. no! His sweet little ask you, ask you to spit on him. Mm. Uh, yeah, Frosty Evie, what's, what's, what's other ones that stick out to you? Oh, we got some Hollow Knight here. And I tell you, Ooh. love the game, love the game to bits. The map design. Dear God. Uh, open-ended? Okay, sure. Problem with Metroidvania is, is you can hit these points where you go, I don't know if I'm lost, if the game's broken, or I'm stupid. Mm-hmm. Right? And, th- and this is what makes it great on replays, because on a replay, you can go in like five different directions and you've took off and you know, you've know you started to venture in, in a different um, permutation as you had before. But mm-hmm. maybe the first time you could go a bit more linear just at the start before opening up. And then, I don't know, New Game Plus is when it's like, hey, now some of these gates are unlocked and you can go in any direction that you want. It could have definitely helped itself in that way. And um, 
I think I think that's my main hang up on it. I was mostly thinking on Minecraft. I, I don't. I think that might just be a perfect game, isn't it? Mm. But no, I take. I'm gonna take Hollow Knight's map as much as I love it. As much as I'm like, this is at the top for some Metroidvanias. That map is an actual nightmare. Do you uh, like? How do you feel about the obligation to have to find a dude to unlock the map for the part of the game you're in? Mm. See, for me, that kind of that kind of kills the momentum for me. Like, I was trying to replay it not too long ago, sure, and uh, I quickly sort of felt a bit mentally exhausted when what I really wanted was sort of an idle layabout Metroidvania where I could just focus on filling out the map like Symphony of the Night. Well, Funny thing Islet, about so. what's it, Cornifer? I think is his name, the map dude. Yeah. Uh, he, I think his implementation is great, and I love it. If you are listening to the game. If you are trying to play the game while playing podcast, because he whistles yeah, from here. Yeah. And so you'll always be like, oh, he's in this room. Let me fuck around and see why. If you're not listening or not paying attention or the volume's lowish and you're listening to a podcast, then it's going to be like, oh, like there are certain games where I'm like, oh, I need to be listening to what this game is telling me, because right. not just because the music's good or the story's good, but like mechanically it is trying to express things via its sound design. Right. Well, Two things, look, though. Uh, you can look for pieces of paper, too, in right. fairness, That's before right, the yeah. chat brings it up. Yeah, yeah, but you can you can hear him humming from like three rooms out, and help you locate him in that way. But well, now, yeah. two things there is you do need him for the map, but you also need to equip a charm to see where you are. Otherwise, yeah. you just oh, get the map. Oh yeah, and I was that like, this, feels, this is a little like, obtuse for a like, little fucky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's why I say great one. It's a great one, but this is not for starters. This is not for someone who's like, oh, what's all what's all this about Metroidvania? Is like, no, go play. Yeah. Uh, what is it? I mean, Lucha can... Libre. <laughs> You can get away without a map or like a thing that indicates where the player is on the map if you're a game with very distinct environment design, like a Dark Souls. Mm -hmm. You can't get away with it in, I'd say, a 2D Metroidvania where any like room looks like like a million other rooms. I mean, it's, it's fairly distinct, but also I don't think the map updates until you get to the bench. That's another thing. No, too. yeah, because you like uh, sit down uh, and almost like write yeah, out the map when you're out. getting there. Yeah, but, um, um, that game came out in like what twenty. It's, it's, it's on the older side. I imagine um, Silk Song is going to have so much more quality of life. And if it's not, maybe the dev is like this morning. Oh, I know. It's so, happening. So those are uh, the only things. I feel like, sure, have your hard games, but you didn't have to be too unbearable for newcomers, you know? Mm -hmm. So, still great. Yeah, okay. I'll do, I'll do yeah, still great. Yeah. Well, I'm going to bring up Half Life as oh. uh, my next one. But it's a and, perfect uh, game. No, it isn't. Half Life <laughs> One uh, is an easy one. People probably expected me to say Zen here, yeah. uh, but what I'm going to say is just uh, jumping. Generally, Half Life <laughs> was still coming off a tradition of '90s first-person shooters, where they insisted on having jumping challenges mm -hmm. all throughout. And Half Life's full of the fucking things. If it's if it's not trying to like navigate a very narrow ledge and leap onto a ladder, it's trying to get through that fucking factory processing area with all the rotating platforms and shit. And then Zen is just like platforming uh, up to 11. Yeah. And I never really liked first-person platforming, especially in this, that style of first-person game, because you can't see your feet. Right. And uh, there's just a general sort of uh, spatial awareness issue with jumping puzzles in first-person games. Yeah, and they didn't really, like that was like before the era of mantling to where it's like, oh, you're close enough, yes. your character will grab the ledge and pull yes. himself up. And they still stubbornly insist on not fixing the fact that the game relies on crouch jumping uh, Which in place of mantling. you don't do the tutorial like Casey and I didn't do, when you get to that section, you're like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> exactly. Well, just maybe. a fundamental thing you need to do. And you just, if you don't know about it, you're kind of fucked. Yeah. yeah Half-Life 2 on. corrects that. There's not so much jumping fuckery in Half-Life 2. Half-Life 2 does have its own issues, though. I don't mind the vehicle sections as much as some people do. I think what it is about Half-Life 2 is that it's got the emotional tone of someone with Asperger's Syndrome. I think like it, they try to like play up the personalities and characters in those games. But it always feels like they don't feel real. They don't feel like they're fully engaged with the situations they're in. Everyone they like as in everyone else, or they as in like? Well, first of all, every character's like, 
I think it's partly that the characters all have like uh, unwavering enthusiasm around a character who doesn't talk mm-hmm. and uh, treats him like some kind of unstoppable messiah figure that they all love very much, even though he's got the social skills of a lemon. And part of it's that they're all like living in a hideous dystopian future where aliens turn them into Cenobites and they're all just pissing about and having a good time and having giggles. It just feels like the emotional tone of Half-Life 2 always just feels like a little off to me. Yeah, I mean, I think there's that the sort of having the player surrogate be like a, almost like a Christ figure, like you are everything um, <laughs> without really digging into like the, you know, the, for a recent example, like the way Dune does it, like Paul Atreides is a Christ figure. And then you get on, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't going well. Like, oh, no, are you going to do start doing bad things? Um, like that's interesting. Whereas we never, I don't know if that was ever the plan with Gordon, but at like Gordon felt infallible, despite the fact that Gordon was initially the one who fucked everything up and caused everything. It was, to, that was how that went. Well, yeah, you caused well, it, right? You 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 do the, you do it's the your test. Fault. <laughs> it's kind of your fault. Yeah, you're bad at your job. Well, it's it's complicated. We have to get into the deep lore. But uh, the intention was never to be a character focused game in the first game. Yeah, was, you know, like all the characters are just like copy pastes of each other. They're just random scientists. There's no like real characterization there. It's all more about uh, environmental storytelling and uh, exploring the situation. But Half Life Two came back and decided it had to be really character focused and focus on yeah. bringing across personality with the character animations and things. And suddenly, Gordon being a mute feels really out of place in that. Yeah, when you're surrounded by people who are very like bubbly and like, yeah. especially at the time, like really kind of great fleshed out characters. Yeah. And there's one bit where Alex Vance like tells a bad joke and uh, goes, "Am I right? Am I right?" And then seems really deflated when Gordon doesn't react. That's, that's what like I was the saying. one time. That's the one time people react the way they should around someone who doesn't talk, like yeah. someone who just completely sucks the energy out of the room. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they talk so much out of weakness, and here comes this man who needs not talk. Lisa not guy. Yeah. You know, like who? Lisa not guy. What a character. I think even like Half-Life Alex, uh, the tone uh, was kind of weird, especially when uh, you run into the horror section of the game with uh, yeah. Jeff. And uh, characters are still just being silly about it. Like Alex just goes, I hate Jeff to herself. I mean, is that like a quirky, Whedon-esque kind of way. Is that indicative of like a problem across a lot of games, including a lot of games I love, of... Uh, when you try to change directions and uh, introduce not a mechanic that's going to be there for a while, but a like bite-sized tone or mechanic. So stealth in a game that isn't about stealth. Usually those uh, sections like across the board are kind of like the Yiga clan in Breath of the Wild or even like some of the stealth sections in uh, uh, the Spider-Man games where you're playing as someone who isn't Peter are like fucking bad. And I'm like, why? Like, why is this here? Why is that turret section in the first dead space like dead space one is great and then you get to that turret section you're like this is stupid why are you making me do this like this is not what you were doing this whole time i think people like designers fall into a lot of traps when it comes to creating variety in gameplay Mm -hmm. because if it's variety that doesn't integrate with the core mechanics then you get what you describe i do think there's validity in the philosophy of peaks and troughs like yeah. there has to be like downtime between the really exciting bits and sometimes that manifests through things like Mini games or like easy bits. Oh, and, peaks uh, and troughs. I heard pigs and troughs. Okay, peaks oh, yeah, and troughs. Just give me all of it. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit mush mouthed there. I mean, pigs also work with troughs, though. So. I mean, again, like the whole like enjoyment factor in Pacific Drive for me is that you have the exciting drives, but then you can like just take your time and have a bit of downtime fixing up the car before you go on the next one. What if that's mm-hmm. the stressful part? <laughs> Like brings me back to memories of my dad. Just give me the wrench. Which <laughs> one? That one. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of times those diversions or even those tonal shifts work, and I never complain about them when they work because I think like the the sort of the dual nature of like a persona system where you're mm-hmm. living your normal life and then dungeon crawling like those two work harmoniously uh, in a really in a I really. I think I've great said way. before that it works for me in Persona because both gameplay threads give me a chance to take a break from the other. <laughs> yeah, honestly. That's why right. you should date multiple people at the same time. What? If you're always in need of a break from the other, why play? Well, I guess, you know, both uh, 
Japanese visual novel life simulating and JRPG dungeon crawling are things I can only tolerate for a certain amount of time. Yeah, I guess yeah. it's the equivalent of like you wouldn't eat the same meal every day of the week, right? Even like your favorite yeah. meal. Eventually you want you want to take a break and then you come back to it and you're like, oh man, I really miss this meal. Uh, like sure, if, you're, if you're eating hamburgers every day of the week, that's, you're that dude from Popeye. I don't know. It's, it's like uh, I'm having vodka and Diet Coke because I can't stand the taste of Diet Coke and I can't stand the taste of vodka, you know? <laughs> yeah, that works. <laughs> that works. Uh, did you uh, sp- stick with Half Life? Did you have anything with the Portal games? We kind of mentioned them before we went live. Um, well, I feel like this is something you could say about a lot of games, but the worst thing about the Portal for me was uh, the fan base. I, like, yeah. I was on record when Portal first came out saying I honestly couldn't think of anything bad to say about it. Mm hmm. It's funny, it's uh, short, so it doesn't outstay its welcome. It's got uh, a really, like, mind-blowing gameplay uh, th- uh, gimmick running through it. Mm-hmm. But then all, all anyone could do was quote the fucking cake joke. Yeah. For years, just mentioning cake would set him off. Uh, the companion cube, too. Yeah, that and that. Those were a lot the two. Of people were referencing GLaDOS. That's how I found Portal. Uh, it was annoyed me when they referenced the companion cube joke because it showed that they like mentioning how much they how much they really really loved their companion cube, and because saying that feels like repeating the joke without understanding it. The yeah. joke was that Glados didn't understand human emotions. She was trying to get you attached to a fucking box. Yeah, she just put a heart on she, it. Because like, yeah. she thought that was how she could manipulate you. Yeah. The joke was that that didn't work. But it did. Because it was they, a fucking box. And they sell <laughs> gangbusters at Hot Topic. <laughs> How many of you know someone who has a companion cube fob? I, do. <laughs> I, do. I don't have, I don't own one. Know I know them? someone who has one. Uh, I, mean, I don't know one. That's yeah. how you own them. Okay. No, no, no. Um, yeah, that's I mean, it's... Jo- that's why I can't watch Monty Pratt and the Holy Grail anymore. I'd say you've ruined the jokes. Too many people yeah. like coconuts or what? Honestly, it's almost like... I, I feel like that could be... We, we could place this on almost anything like anything's mm. worst element is its rabid fan base or like when something sort yeah. of escapes a small and not not being like a hipster like oh i like this before it's cool but like there's a certain point where like a joke escapes like kind of the the small community and then just becomes part of the zeitgeist and at that point you're like i don't know when like an arby's brand account is using a joke you're like all right i probably mm. this has this has run its course yeah uh. Sick transit, Gloria Monday. The fans. Yeah, the must pass. I mean, the the thing that's most annoying is just how split the fans are, and they don't acknowledge each other either. They fight everyone else. So you will just sit here with a nice, moderate opinion, and you're surrounded by extremists on either side, just going like, "Oh, they had too much of this." So like, oh, I quite like that. Like for everyone who like Portal Two over Portal One, instead of just saying, "Yo, these are two bad bitches," we're pitting them. <laughs> we're pitting them against each other. Portal 2 was, was thicker and more luscious, whereas the first one, it's like she was more form fit, you know? Yeah. Why? Why can't we just love both? <laughs> Why can't we just love both? Well, I think it's time we switch to Super Chats, because I feel yes. like there's a lot of stuff they're going to bring up. Yeah. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Pay, pay for your favorite game, and we'll find things that we, we hate. Well, we'll tear apart them. everything you love. Well, the point is, we have to learn, we have to teach people to see for themselves what they hate about their favorite games. Yeah. They'll never look that deep. It's an asterisk. These games are still amazing. We still love these games. Yeah. You have to be able yeah. to acknowledge their We didn't flaws. talk about a single game we didn't love. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, uh, okay, starting with Dr. Theo, who gave $5 and says, I can speak for everyone when I say that the worst part of whatever game is your favorite, 99% of the time, it's the community. If you count that, of course. Yeah, well, Theo. that's fitting. Good time. Well, welcome, Doctor Theo. I try to not get involved with any. Yeah, Dragon's Dogma Two, really vocal defenders, apparently. Oh, that's that's all games nowadays. Like the Hell Divers Two community that's actively playing, I love them. I really do. But the ones that sit there more often than not, just like this is the greatest game ever. But then also the detractors that feel like they got burned and they must convince you, no, don't date my ex. She's a harlot, bitch, witch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why did you date it's her then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or why don't you just move on to the next thing? There's a ton of games. Oh, like, go play the game no. you are liking. Bunny of fish in the sea. Jacob mm-hmm. Kitty gives us $2 and says, The worst thing about Tears of the Kingdom is Link can't cross-dress. Come on, Nintendo. Pull it's together. True. I, remember, I remember seeing, like, a meme image that, was, uh, that just had the logo for Link's Awakening at the top. And then there was a picture of Link wearing the women's outfit from Breath the of the Wild. <laughs> looking, yeah, looking at, us, looking at himself in the mirror. 
my sexual it was awakening. felt very yeah it always felt very gender neutral very like it's more about the practicality of the clothing than anything else he is a bit of a girly boy is that link yeah, he's got that Japanese, very handsome androgyny thing going on. Why is he? Why is he green again? Is he a ranger? Uh, elf colors? I don't know, because it was the color they could use on the Nintendo palette that wouldn't clash with anything else. I yeah. suppose. Fair. I know his design in uh, Link to the Past, or his design in Ocarina of Time, I believe, was uh, inspired by Leonardo DiCaprio in uh, Baz Luhrmann's Ro- Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> That is at least the, uh, that's apocryphal. I don't know if that's real or not. Okay. okay. I was about to Miyamoto say. just hanging out watching, just crushing tape, watching Titanic, The Beach. And Romeo Asler plus Juliet. Romeo Juliet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if any of those movies were out when that came. So none of this might be real, but oh, it's no, fine. No. Uh, Frog42 gives a, yeah, that's the very one I was talking about, uh, Eric. Well found. Yeah. <laughs> well found, Eric. Uh, Frog Frog Forty Two gives eight dollars and says, "I love you guys. Can't wait to watch this later. I love Minecraft, but it's definitely one of those games you can't play without the wiki." Yeah, oh, so is that like? That. Sorry, what? I've been playing it quite a few years after my review and discovering they'd like patched in a tutorial at some point. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how uh, effective it is. Handholdy. There's achievements too that kind of guide you through the progression systems of separate things like getting to a cake. Getting to diamond. Yeah. Uh, well, it's redstone. never going to. It's never going to tutorialize how to make a cake, so you kind of do have to look that up. No, it I mean, how do you feel about having games where you kind of need a, a oh, another window open? Um, yeah, that, that, that's like Terraria. Well, yeah, yeah. Are you even saying a little bit with uh, Binding of Isaac, right? Well, that's another thing that annoyed me about Dark Souls is that the only way to craft boss weapons <clears> is to have a wiki open and say which specific weapon you need to get up to level fifteen and what specific upgrade item to combine it with. To create the boss weapon. That's the Pokemon thing, you know? It's like, here, you have a different legendary, I have a different legendary, let's pool our resources together. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> a couple birds running around. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I I never play a game w- like with the wiki right by my side. However, I do pull things up all the time, Like especially when I start off a game, and if there's a game that has like, a shit ton of loot, I'm going to look up, like, what should I not sell? Like, what is... Mm. Did, did I pick up... one? Of, is one of these 30 things rare? Is one of these things something I'm going to want to keep to fuse a, a cool weapon later on? Or is this all like literally junk? I kind of like it when a game like Persona, when you clear out a dungeon, it'll just be like, here's all your junk. It is literally junk. It is just to be sold. And so I'm like, great. Thank you for telling me that. I will sell all of this and not sell anything else because I know this is all junk. This is why we have colored loot. <laughs> yeah. This is why we have colored loot. This is, this is the problem. Well, yeah. I mean, I appreciate a game that, where the item description says, this is loot. Sell it in a shop. But yeah. half of them, in Dragon's Dogma 2, I noticed this as well. Some of the items would show that, but uh, a lot of the rest of them would be, this is an item used in crafting. I was like, okay, but is it going to be used in crafting something I would want? If it's a, yeah. Is it only used for crafting spears when I'm a sword main? Yeah. Then I'm going to want to sell it, aren't I? Maybe at some point in your life you want to become a spear guy. No, yes. that's, you know, midlife crisis of the adventurer, I think. <laughs> I, honey, I bought a bunch of spears. That's the lamest adventure you could be. Like, how do you get it through the door, I say? <laughs> Every time. Um, yeah, I do. That being said, I do like games where I have to keep a little notebook next to me and I jot down notes and thoughts and, like, oh, uh, I'm going to come back to this. Uh, for us, the game we were talking about earlier, like, I have a similar thing. I've, I have a notebook with, like, but you've got a pencil in there. Got a pencil in the game, but like I'm quicker than a digital pencil. That's what they <laughs> yeah, say about me. They like, <laughs> yeah, fastest pencil in the West. <laughs> yeah, I do uh, like I a mean, map that lets you draw on it and, and put different stamps. Yeah, thief two, kind of you, know, you get to write on it and draw a scribble on the that's, thing. That's good on like the DS. I want a tangibility. Like oh, I like the well. the dungeon crawling games on the DS. The the uh, Persona Qs and Etrian Odyssey. You can kind of you are yeah. drawing your own map and draw and writing notes and stuff. I'm cool. with you. I'm, yeah. I'm a little sicko when it comes to my Metroidvanias because there's this funny thing I do where I've got like a GIMP opened up on a massive massive screen and I will go into a room, screenshot and put it on my thing and then go into the uh, next you're room, a, screen. Oh, and, oh you're oh, a mask guy. That's yeah. real sick. I'm a sicko, absolutely. That's and, but real it's so sick. pretty afterwards. You're just like, yeah. oh, that's, that's cool how it flows. Some people like, to, some people like doing that. I that's like cool. Maps. I like that. Yeah. I like maps. Anyway, uh, Thief 2 was another game I was going to bring up, actually. We'll see if it comes up again. Wesley Thomas gives to Canadian and says, paying full price for half the game's annoying. Uh, God knows what like they're specifically referring to. 
Uh, Race Carlock, he has $5 and says, I love GTA games, but I get the bad feeling they're responsible for the industry's worst instincts. Open worlds, graphic obsessions, crunch, budgets. I'm looking for Possibly. Wars. Certainly yeah. the crunch thing. But um, I think <clears throat> a lot of the open world games in these days seem to very deliberately not take the right lessons from GTA games. Yeah. I think we're just ripping off the Ubisoft model more than anything else. Where it's just a so. checklist of stuff to do. Yeah. Rock- Rockstar Open Worlds always um, uh, tend to be more about the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so every like side quest is like, there's like a story thread running through it where you have to keep talking to some specific NPC. And uh, you very rarely have to uh, unlock all the districts like you would in a Ubisoft game. Yeah. Any any complaints for a, a GTA? Uh, well, I think Red Dead Redemption Two could have like made the map a bit smaller, so you weren't didn't have twenty minute commutes everywhere to go. Right. Yeah, I don't think it needed to be that big. Um, GTA, I mean, like GTA San Andreas has some terrible um, like pr- uh, remote control plane flying missions. There was a lot of area. shit in San Andreas, like all the fucking mini games to build your stats. Was a, yeah, you know, yeah, that was, definitely was, felt like was, one of those kitchen sinks. Experimental. Like, yeah, it was an yeah. experimental period for open world game design, and a lot of the stuff it was trying fell flat. I'd say. Yeah. Which again was crazy that they turned out that trilogy on the same that three yeah. Vice City and that were on the same generation of consoles, whatever four years apart. San Andreas was sort of the last gasp for that era of graphics, I'd say. Uh, I would say so. Yeah. After that was like the like the new HD era. Yeah, because San Andreas was at the tail end of the PS2, and then by the time four came around, we were obviously on the new consoles and yeah. All that. Everything was brown. Everything was brown and covered in bloom lighting effects. God bless the brown era. <laughs> I love it. Take uh, Red, Dwarf, Red Dwarf 42 gives 199 and says, Halo the library, uh, with no further comment. Damn. I have to get Nick on and see how that... Uh, uh, that's uh, yeah, that's, that's a that's mission, a, I imagine, right? Yeah, that's like an infamously disliked mission in the original Halo. Never uh, played I think that's where the flood are introduced, maybe? Right. Uh, like uh, the dogmatic... The dogmatic director gives $2 and says something that might cause arguments. Uh-oh. Bloodborne has the chalice dungeons. That is all. Yeah. What are them? Those are the, sort of the randomly generated dungeons. Um, I don't, I don't mind the chalice dungeons. I think there's a lot of single player games that would benefit from having like a randomly generated dungeon side content. If you just want to like fuck around. Like I like this yeah. game a lot. And I just want to fuck around. When you just want to piss strong. about with the yeah. core loops and maybe like grind up your stats a bit. I That's think a lot of games are from that. <laughs> <laughs> when you grind up your stats and want to buy a new hat, that's a more. <laughs> no, I like. It. I mean, that roguelike end game is starting to become a little bit more popular with even triple A's. Done God of War, have yeah, that? yeah, God of War introduced that one. Yeah, yeah, like Re- Returnal sort of pulled the trigger. Returnal, on that, yeah, yeah. Uh, Red Dwarf 42 gets 199 and says, Breath of the Wild. He's got a lot of opinions, that Red Dwarf 42. Uh-oh. Breath of the Wild, weapon durability, the lightning mechanic, and sliding down wet rocks. Yeah, the lightning mechanic is if you get caught in a lightning storm, you have to unequip anything that is metal, uh-huh. including like armor, shields, bows, swords, or you'll be struck by lightning. That's funny, um, does that does that extend to the baddies? Do they get struck by lightning? It does. Yeah, you can. In the middle of a fight, you can. If an enemy, uh, you could disarm an enemy, throw down a metal weapon. They will go to pick up the metal weapon and then get struck by lightning. So like, that's shit. That shit's clever. Yeah, it's like, emergent systems. Lethal yeah. Company had that where Marty was like, "Oh shit, we're all holding metal." <laughs> what? Like, oh no, it's not good. Yeah. yeah. But the we- weapon durability. Definitely. That's still, even as I try to like get deeper into the game, I'm just sick of it. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. fair enough. I mean, the game is trying to like engineer a way for you to engage with its more uh, sort of uh, emergent systems. Yeah, I actually don't mind. Um, Weapon durability is the one thing on that list I don't mind. Um, I do not like wet rocks, though. Get these wet rocks out of here. I think I'd be fine. I'd, be, I'd have more time for weapon durability if like it didn't just flat out remove a weapon you're in the middle of using. Like if it just like severely nerfed its damage. Like you could Ooh, still yeah. get out of this particular encounter and then worry about but it's a yeah. Uh, but the, the sword's edge has been dulled and so it's not yeah. causing a lot yeah. of Yeah. It just feels and too you weren't much, 
is and, on. Oh no, Yahtzee, you uh, were on record as not being crazy about using kind of the the fusion in uh, Tears of the Kingdom. Like, to you, yeah. you wanted more well, from that as opposed to just. Yeah, I feel like there was some missed opportunities there. I feel like if the game had engineered a way we could pick up any item and use it as a melee weapon, mm-hmm. that I think would have been part of the spirit of that game more mm-hmm. than just gluing a rock to the end of a sword. Yeah. You know? It misses the male fantasy of being in the woods and finding a really nice stick, you know? Like, yeah. that's that's the missed opportunity there. Like, I would still, like, I thought about this many years ago. I was thinking about Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. I was like, what if you had a system like that, but for melee weapons in a game? And you, like, d- adjusted the physics in accordance with how heavy it was and uh, where you held it, etc. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Liza P did a bit of that, that mixed match, but I know what you mean, where it's like yeah. proper engineer and make this yeah, thing. It just yeah, like yeah. falls apart and makes a fart sound. I go, oh, oops. Yeah. Like, uh, really, like, if you like, really like uh, handicap the player if they went for something ridiculously too big, that's yeah. just completely off balance. Like, it's just scrap metal on the end of a stick. <laughs> just like, trying to heave it in the yeah air. and then you could find like yeah. strange things that are so off balance it keeps on spinning and you've perpetually motioned yourself yeah yeah uh john brooks gives ten dollars and ten pounds rather and says total war franchise anti-player bias in ai factions especially in historic title they should be dealing with enemies closer to home but beeline for you on the other end of the map are any yeah. of us total war guys uh, no warhammer no, Total War is I might just have like a Sega franchise. Two right? different franchises. Yeah, Total War is just like historic battles, right? Oh, these. Um, oh. But yeah, this even removed from Total War, that idea of any game where like the enemies seem to know you are the main character and are going after you in a battle where there's a bunch of shit going on, like you know, you should be able to sort of become as obscure as any random soldier in a thing like that. So them yeah. just making a beeline uh, seems kind of ridiculous. Mm. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, Fox D gives five dollars and says Stardew Valley. Every other game in its genre now has adjustable speed settings, but Stardew remains utterly frantic if you want to get things done. Is that cheating, though? What speed settings? If oh, you mean like the day, the day is slower. I mean, you could just pause the game if it's getting on top of you. Yeah, I kind of like that. There's a deadline to things. If for me yeah yeah it's not just it's not just you know breezing through not having to care no that's just me uh ben s gives 499 and says elden ring tight night system makes all loot boring every cool new weapon is useless because it's so much weaker than my starting halberd plus 50 i think that's a larger dark souls issue ben s i find dark souls 3 especially i'd say i was like using my starting longsword right to the end of the game yeah, and yeah, then you have to like look up a wiki of like, oh, what do the end game weapons do? Like, I didn't swap out until I found out yeah. you could have that like flaming scimitar yeah, you, thing. You yeah. don't really know what's worth putting your the effort into, yeah. like building up and starting to use without knowing ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it almost seems built for a second playthrough. Where... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, see, that's that's one thing. One frustration in some games that I absolutely love is that they seem built for multiple runs, and I don't always have them in me like that, whereas rogues are, are built nice and tight and small, so you can have these multiple runs. Well, there you go. Uh, Red Dwarf 42 comes back with 499 and says, Dark Souls 2, Scholar of the First Sin, adaptability and enemies disappearing after beating them a number of times. Yeah, I'm kind of with you on the disappearing enemies thing. Yeah. It feels like it always felt like uh, I'd let the game down, and it was sort of <laughs> like uh, the kid. Oh no, I made the game sad. And it was like removing enemies with a sort of air of, uh, well, we've got to get you through this somehow. I mean, that helped Nick in his playthrough of the horrible lava place. Where I was like, it's all right, Nick. It's thirteen more times, and there'll be less. <laughs> you know, it gets them through eventually. Uh, I mean, for Dark Souls too, as much as um, I enjoyed it. The bonfire thing is even more uh, more of an issue in that one. Yeah, yeah, because uh, you can just go anywhere at any time. So I don't really even remember the map that well in Dark Souls Two. It's just always like a forward progression thing. It's not like in Dark Souls One where you go and it's like, oh, so this is what it looks like from the back. It's like never seeing the back of your own haircut. Yeah, I mean that's Dark Souls Two in a nutshell, right? Is like we're gonna throw a bunch of different oh. uh, disparate locations and themes and everything, and sort of not join them at all. So. 
you can experience them all separately in never their own seen, little bubbles. Never seen the back of your own hair, Kurt. Someone doesn't know how to hold up a hand mirror in front of another mirror. A vampire. I see nothing. Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Hjorth87 gives 20 Danish kroner and says, just made you think of Clive Barker's Jericho. Oh no, oh, oh. I, having read I out the it. title, I had to think about Clive Barker's Jericho for a second. I think Shout the best Jericho. way to summarize Clive Barker's Jericho is that Clive Barker once was quoted as saying, subtlety in horror is overrated. <laughs> and I think that explains a lot. That does, yeah. Uh, the Piss Bandit gives $10 and says, Pre-hard mode Terraria could be ripped out completely and nobody will miss it. On a more personal note, I had to drop Cuphead because I couldn't stop myself from grinding up the level grades in uni. Oh, I, I, will say, I wouldn't even say that's something I'd fault a lot of these games for. Games that I love having a, a score system. Actually, Children of the Sun, its scoring system, if anything, almost took away from the meticulous nature because I saw the longer you spent in the level, the more it would uh, penalize you. And it wasn't until later on where I said, ah, screw your grades that I got to actually, like, stop in between shots and, like, oh, this is an interesting world that I'm in, you know? Yeah, Instead, yeah. Before I was just, like, boom, shotgunning a rifle, funny enough. Yeah, it almost feels like those things, like, the score system shouldn't have even popped up until, like, you'd already beaten the level once. Yeah. Give you Kinda something. Like, like, you really sit in it and, and experience the story and the tone and everything. Yeah. Like, it felt like it was just there, tacked on, not like, you know, neon white where you, those trophies did something for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Pat Attack 13 gives $10 and let's celebrate their first super on a live stream Yay! Oh. I've been playing a lot of Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth and while it's been great seeing these characters in this world fully realised the generic open world stuff, Towers really overstays its welcome after a while well I know what you should look forward to Pat Attack 13 and that's this week's fully ramblematic on Wednesday I think uh, you will get on with it you know what? I think we all need to put some respect on Chadley's name. Yeah, who Chadley. is this fucking Chadley dude? Oh, he's just Chadley. You know, but as one does. I, I feel like That's maybe it, like because he wasn't in the original game, and I feel like like someone on the new team has this sort of like OC that he's been hankering to put in something for many years, and that's Chadley. Yeah, it's my time. <laughs> we here respect Chadley. Uh, Why do yeah. we have to do everything Chadley tells us to do? He tells uh, us to keep telling us to do boring overworld shit. Maybe Chadley's like our 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 Jiminy Cricket. I also like how they created a second Chadley who annoys Chadley. So it's like it's almost <laughs> like the the cycle of uh, grief and revenge uh, from the Last of Us Part Two. It's, it's like Scrappy Doo thing. has another more annoying Scrappy Doo. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh God. Strange name. That's an adjective. Oh. Yeah. Classic Chadley. Uh, John Brooks gives ten pounds and says, "Forgot which are three. No magic use in the mandatory fistfight scenes. So the expert monster hunter mutant gets his ass kicked by hobos and a card shark. CD Projekt Red fist fighting seemed poor to me anyway. Yeah, that does seem kind of silly. I suppose, but I mean, it's in Geralt's neutral manner. He doesn't want to just straight up kill everybody. Like that's that's yeah. a game you'll enjoy if you enjoy his alignment." If you don't, and you're just like, I could kill every last one of you, then you're just going to broke the immersion, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I guess it depends on how you play uh, Gurel. You could certainly play him as a psychopath who just swords everyone up. Mm. Swords everyone right up. Uh, Cupcake Kamisama gives £10 and says, I bought a copy of Will Save the Galaxy for Food as a reward for submitting my own work to literary agents. Can't wait for that, and hi to the whole Windbreak podcast crew from sunny Manchester. Thank you, Cupcake Kamasama. I hope I you enjoy like the book. Manchester's and, not actually sunny. <laughs> and also the second book and also the third book that came out very recently, Ooh. if you're interested. Good luck trilogy. submitting to literary agents. If you're submitting solicited, if you're submitting unsolicited, you'll need all the luck you can get, frankly. So much luck. Uh, Ryan Betts gives $2 and says, True or false, Metroid Prime fixed FPS platforming. Mm. Uh, fixed um, I mean I think FPS platforming is kind of bad unless your game is about that fixed or succeeded in spite of yeah because you can't say fixed because like that would mean everyone afterwards was like oh, we got it alright we're all just gonna do this because I think there's still some no, yeah. platforming in the yeah I've, I've, I've I've dis I disagree with you Ryan but it's false I think it is better than Half-Life I would I, say I, 
Mirror's Edge was getting towards fixing FPS platforming <laughs> by focusing less on accurately landing on things and more on just treating the main character as a projectile we were firing out of our person gun. Yeah. Hey, what was that? Infinite Runner? That popular one on mobile? Shoot. Cannibalt? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, no. I like that, though. That, that instead of being about precision, it's more about getting your momentum from one yeah. spot to the other, very like neon white. Yeah. Lining yeah. up, like the first person perspective works better with gameplay based around lining up your line of sight with things. And that's what mm -hmm. the, the parkour ups uh, focused on. So it's mm -hmm. not, it's less about having to land on a platform and then accidentally continuing to press forward for too long and falling off because you couldn't see your fucking feet. <laughs> Uh, Fox D gives $5 and says, Eating the same thing every day is one thing. Eating at a place like Cracker Barrel every day for a month is another. Best part of games like Persona. If you say so, Fox D. Yeah. I, want a Persona where, I want a Persona where our hideout is in a Cracker Barrel. The mini game, well, like those little, the little peg mini game where you jump. My mother pegs. loves Cracker Barrel so much. Every I birthday. Mean, I can understand, I can understand eating. I can understand eating somewhere at like the Cheesecake Factory uh, every day. Because sure. that has such a huge menu, mm -hmm. uh, you could eat something different every day. All but at the same it. time, at the same time, any restaurant that has a menu that big, you need to be very cautious of, because you know it's all coming out of the fucking freezer. Yeah, yeah, it's just you know all the same permutation of stuff. We... <clears throat> Richard Wells gives $10 and says, Fallout, you pick locked doors with bobby pins until you reach a door that says, this door needs a key to unlock. All the locked doors needed keys. <laughs> That's why I picked <laughs> them. <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. It's certainly a breakdown of the immersive sim thing. I mean, I think like Deus Ex was pretty good for this sort of thing, but every now and again you just went to a door that was infinite strength and infinite lockpick strength, so you'd mm -hmm. had to find the key for it, which was a bit yeah. of a lurch. That was an interesting one. That thing they do where keys are consumable, right? Where I'm like, okay, oh. I understand if this one key correlates to this one door, but it's like, no, you can only just use the key once yeah, on any door. A general like, small key. You can use it on any small key yeah. door. That's not how idiot. They don't work. know they can pull a key out of the lock after they open the door. That's one of those uh, <laughs> realism sacrifice for a gameplay mechanic situation. Yeah. Damn. Just puts the where, key in, like, damn. <laughs> Damn, it blows the door now. From a game design perspective, if you ever have to choose between realism or fun gameplay, 100% always take uh, fun, fun gameplay. Game yeah. <laughs> always go as real as possible. Yeah. <laughs> hit, hit on their own misery. Yeah. yeah. Tsunami Dusher gives $10 and says, Splatoon 3. In an online match, most of all players decide to not play a match. Instead, they and just walk to center stage, jumping around or teabagging. All the wait for non action is frustrating. Listen, maybe you're just taking a kid's game a little too serious, bud. All right? You can yeah. sign up for tournaments if you want. Well, that reminds me of when they first introduced conga dancing to Team Fortress 2. And um, for a while, every server, everyone would just down tools and just conga dance around the map for a while. It's just build. I feel like Splatoon should just build separate modes that are just like dance party mode. Yeah. You can I mean, go play on the dance party map. It's just uh, as in Smite, they would always say, "Dance party, dance party." If you're not dancing, you're breaking. I would just get a, a pentakill because you're all just sitting in the same spot. What's stopping me? Uh, shoot them um, anyway, tsunami. That's what I say. Comes, comes a point where actually playing the game is being a troll. Mm -hmm. uh, Hunter Roach ten dollars says, "My favorite game, Super Metroid, is great, but there are definitely games that came after it that refined its controls and made the path forward less obtuse." Sure. Yeah. Don't think, don't think I ever played through Super Metroid. Personally. Oh my God, I've played really plenty good. of I've played plenty of other Metroidvanias. I've played through Metroid Fusion and uh, a bunch of the more recent ones. Yeah, it has. Uh, Super Metroid also has some uh, uh, optional mechanics that the environment teaches you. Like you find these little critters who are wall jumping, and it sort of teaches you, oh, I can wall jump. But the problem is the mm. wall jumping fucking sucks. Like it is right. the least intuitive wall jumping. Like I played that game probably through 15 times and every time i do it i'm like i don't know how to wall jump i don't know what it wants from me and it's very frustrating um so yeah oh, I, I would say that's up there that's definitely one of those games when i replay it i definitely use rewinding and save states because i'm like listen the reason i didn't make this jump isn't on me this is on you and so i'm just gonna 
I'm going to keep reloading that save until I make this jump. Not me. Not me. This is not my fault. Eric, Um, we stopped talking about Chadley. He can go away now. You know what? I I would like Chadley to stay here. I'm going to sit. I'm going to sick toffee on Chadley. Oh, no. I feel like Chadley would be afraid of dogs. Yes. Rawr. Piss off, asshole. (laughs) <laughs> kill, kill, kill. Arr, 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 arr. Oh no, he's killing Chadley. Our sweet AI boy. I thought he was an AI, but he's an actual boy in real life, so I don't know what, what his deal is. Ask whoever's OC he is. Uh, Steamtastic Vagabond, good name there, gives six ninety nine Canadian and says, Minecraft's inventory has been broken for years. The game has far too many different items for a measly 27 slots. Built some think, test, you idiot. Yeah. Do you ever think maybe you're a hoarder? <laughs> so, yeah, what are, are there moments in games that make you realize like you have actual like real world like human problems? And you're like, oh no, this is a me problem, isn't it? Well, <clears throat> probably something I've mentioned previously that every time I'm given a choice, uh, I just go with whatever choice doesn't disappoint the person I'm currently talking to because I'm afraid of confrontation. Mm-hmm. Are you? <clears throat> Yes. So I have some stubborn phlegm. Mm. Phlegm, phlegm, phlegm. Uh, Nick Knoll gives $10 and says, BG3's inventory management system almost made me quit after five hours on PS5. I'm 500 plus hours now and love the game, but I still loathe playing with my backpacks and pouches like Troika dolls. We're not the Red Dead problem. The looting got a bit uh, bogged down later in the game. Mm. Yeah, I mean... At a certain point, I mean, I got that's like the double edged sword, right? Like, do you want to adhere to that kind of realism where you have to make choices of because, like, sometimes on a little adventure in uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, I'd have to be like, ooh, what do I take with me? How Spartan do I want to go out? Like, do I want to risk not having my camping gear on one of my on one of my pawns because it hopes that I find one along the way or or what? Um, and those yeah, kinds of decisions at the moment can be good. I was fine for a while, but then... I meant the actual looting. Like, oh, like, like the literal like opening button. drawers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. some games where it's like, press the button, it's all in, in your system now. Yeah. Whereas the other one's like, all right, I gotta yeah. fondle the balls and tie yeah. the shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Some games you can just walk past the shelf mashing the contextual use button and everything just gets hoovered up. My Every favorite. game should have... A, you should have a vacuum like Luigi in Luigi's Mansion. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what game did have that? Uh, Atomic, Atomic Heart. Heart. Yeah. You could just vacuum a room instead of yeah. having to loot every drawer. That's pretty play, satisfying. You played it off as a power, too, of just like... <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alex Armstrong is $5 and says, even as a fan, where do you start with the worst parts of Sonic? Boost to win, crap dialogue, mismanaged tone, and bugs galore. How incompetent is Sega? See, back to the whole community part. Uh, I'm sure some people love that stuff. But that is Sonic to them. Also, Alex, yeah, that's, yeah. I like the fact that you are a Sonic fan and are still cognizant of all this. This is what we're going for. We just want people to think like this of all their faves. Exactly. Uh, Zaratha gives five R dollars and says, I loved Sea of Stars, but F you, Garl, and the character development allocation that elevates him over everyone else. He's the you know purist. What? He has to. He's our Samwise, yeah, was... our Samwise Gamgee. Yeah. yeah. I was definitely getting that vibe. Like. Yeah. You... They were definitely over-focusing on him a bit. He lost his eye. Like, come on. <laughs> and his, like the two other party members were basically just emotionless monks. Mm-hmm. I was so sure he was going to come up to be the bad guy in that game. And I was not correct. He was yeah, so pure. I thought. Really? really? <laughs> what? Yeah. Yes. When he lost but his eye, I was like, you. ooh, he's definitely going to be a baddie. But it was I, like, oh, I, it's I, not your fault. <laughs> but then like, you like don't see him for 10 years then that, that seems like a good opportunity for a you abandoned me sort of yeah. arc. It's I guess it's because I played the demo. <laughs> the demo starts you off like a little... Oh, yeah, he's later, later on, he's with Next you. time, he's just your bud, yeah. Oops. Uh, Tsunami Dusha gives $10 and says, Zelda Oracles of Ages and Seasons. I love these games, but they don't need to be two separate titles. Huh, a lot of extra room left to type here. You three are good, good chums. Have a nice week. Salute. Oh, thank you, Tsunami Dusha. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Oracle of the Seasons and Age. I, I replayed uh, Seasons recently because uh, it's on the Switch Online, and uh, it it just felt like Diet Zelda. And I'm like, what? There's so many other Zeldas I could play that I like more. I'm not 100% sure why this exists. 
yeah, they did the whole thing. There was two separate games that came out at once, but they it wasn't like a Pokemon Red and Blue where it's like the the changes are minimal. Like they're just legitimately two completely separate games that can speak to each other in um, kind of like a post game yeah. epilogue. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, uh, Alex Armstrong gives five dollars and says, "Speaking of Sonic, thoughts on indie devs making fan games to develop skills to make their own games, like Sparkly Electric Jester and Rolling Rascal." I will Roll. say that. Fan work is a great way to start being a creative. Mm-hmm. It is if you're still doing it a few years into being a creative, something's gone wrong. <laughs> I don't, eh, maybe you just want to make Knuckles but bald. <laughs> like that's all you ever wanted. Now Sonic but bald. Now Amy but bald. Now uh, Tails but bald. I mean, that's just his destiny. Then just make a game about a bunch of bald animals. No, it's it's weirder when there's nothing to like uh-huh. inspire it. I guess. Then it's just bald people running around. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Gildan Yesich gives five dollars and says, "My least favorite part of my favorite games is they're often VR or enjoyed in full screen, so they impede watching second wind streams simultaneously." Like Fair that. enough. VR is a hard thing to second screen. Yeah. yeah, you'd have to be a chameleon. Yeah, you should get one of those AR like glasses. You just oh, have something playing on a screen in the corner of your vision. There you go. Uh, I'd be spinning, just trying to catch it the whole Where time. Is Where yeah. is it? Like a floater. <laughs> um, Magimix2000 gives £10 and says, when the game wants an epic fight but also needs you to lose, so it makes you do the fight, lets you win the combat encounter, and then makes you lose in the following cutscene. You know what I hate is uh, fights where you're supposed to lose but they don't tell you that and you can still use consumable items yeah. in the course yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. That's some real bullshit there. I don't know how you fix that. Like, maybe just you can't use items, lock off items, and so you know this is a... Like the final round of the tournament in Street Fighter uh, 6 springs to mind. What, you can't... The story campaign. Oh, in the story campaign, gotcha. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I don't... It's... Like, I don't know how... How do you inform the player that they're supposed to lose this fight without it being silly? Like, yeah, like, like Resident Evil Six did this all the time as well. I'd, like uh, you're just supposed like you were just supposed to survive like a little while in a boss fight, and then they'd like a cut transition to the next yeah. cut scene, the next bit. I didn't know that. I used to pull my fucking like magnum ammo on yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pain. Uh, Lord Mogadron gives five dollars and says, "In games with crafting systems like Tears of the Kingdom, item durability is dumb." What do we put in the chests? More crafting items. And why can't we craft arrows? Yeah, I mean, crafting systems like that do, I guess, open up. They, they, they invite those kind of, like, uh, very specific criticisms of, wait, if I can make this thing, why can't I make this other thing? Like, I, but As we said before, that's a trough. Or is that the pig? Yeah. 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 Don't put the pig before the trough. Yeah. <laughs> trough before the pig? Well, you put the trough before the pig if you want to feed the pig. That's true. But if you put the trough on a treadmill, then the pig will go for a walk. Now you have infinite energy. We figured it out. (laughs) Uh, Trenton Darnell gives $2 and says, Like a dragon and infinite wealth, material grind. Mm, I thought the grind felt... I didn't feel the material grind in those games were too bad. Uh, they do, Infinite Wealth uh, does have the problem of the randomly, like it has their own sort of chalice dungeons that are kind of kind of butt. They're just boring. Like aesthetically, they're boring. What you do in them is boring. I guess some of the loot you get is good, but... You're like, well, I didn't I don't mind the... Uh, I didn't mind the uh, Underworld dungeons in like, yeah. Dragon and Infinite Wealth because it was just a fun thing to grind while listening to something. Yeah, I guess if you yeah if you treat it as a second screen thing, I think it works more. Yeah. I guess like almost like zoning out and then, going through Mementos or Tartarus or. And then you grind up for a while, and then you got like more powerful for the real yeah. game. Uh, Wesley Thomas gives two Canadian dollars and says, "Any game with stat scaled enemies loses a point." I'm definitely with you on that one, Wesley Thomas. I think all games should give you the chance to go back to the starting area and kick the shit out of the things that once bullied you. Yeah. Oh. I also think that if I mean, if you want to, just stay down there and just goon it out a little bit and show up to the final boss over level. That's your prerogative. Oh, you want to like grind up pigs for eight days or whatever it is? I, I, I want to watch House while I do that. Yes, I mean that's it's just an excuse that. to watch my shows. 
I mean, I remember there was that episode of South Park that was about World of Warcraft, and the way they like beat the villain is like by fighting pigs uh, that each give like one experience for like eight days straight. Yeah, and I was yelling at the screen. I was like, "You can't get experience of enemies that are a certain number of levels below you in World of Warcraft South Park." Yeah. How dare you? Strongly. Yeah. Imagine my surprise in Elden Ring because you could farm those little like monks on a cliff and you get tons and tons of it, but the end game scales with you. And I'm like, well, okay. Hmm. Uh, Alex Armstrong is $2 and says, Consuming Shadow, subpar graphics, maybe a sequel. <laughs> oh, you cheeky bitch, Alex Armstrong. Oh, cheek, cheek, cheek. That's uh, Consuming Shadow is the game I made and that I have frequently said kind of looks like shit. And I've thought about making a sequel in the past. Did you ever think of not making it look that way? Yeah. Well, if you put better graphic, more graphics. Well, it's easy to just say that, isn't it? I mean, this is what feedback's for. Now you know. (laughs) I thought it was great. Estefan Costa gives $5 and says, Witcher series frustrates me. Nice world building stroke storytelling, but the UI and clunky combat always turn me off. You know, before I got to playing The Witcher 3, I heard that across the fandoms, where they're like, this game is shit, because the controls are horrendous, and I was expecting to touch them and vomit instantly. It wasn't that bad, but it was, it was certainly a talking point for the whole time it was out. That was, that was insane. I was expecting, like, I'd lose a finger trying to play this game. Um, you know, it, it seems all right, manageable-ish enough. Yeah. Um... I don't, I guess for a bit of perspective, was it, did they change anything? Did they patch it? Or was it the, the time it came out in 2013? Were there different ways of playing a game? I really don't remember how, like, the first two Witcher games played. And I remember playing them. Mm, I remember yeah. quite liking The Witcher 3, and finally, and finally feeling like I was getting into the combat. It is a Witcher series, though. I do, yeah, one and two play, uh, like, they feel awful. Very close. Okay. Oh. Uh, Pat Attack 13 gives high dollars and says, How do you guys feel about pretty much needing a guide stroke wiki to do all the Persona 5 confidants in a single playthrough? Always struck me as frustrating. I think if you're trying to do that, you're sort of missing the point. Yeah, you, at that you point. Don't, you, don't, you don't need to max out every confidant in a single playthrough. Yeah. You're, you're just supposed to be like going with the flow and doing what you want to do. Yeah, and it's kind of more realistic to like life, where it's you got to make choices that night. You can go out with your friends, or you can go to a batting cage, I guess. Um, but yeah, I feel like at that point you are trying to play a game in the way that is like wiki necessary. I feel like I never went to the batting cages. Was I? Neither did I. Else? Nick went every night. Nick <laughs> just loved those batting cages. Well, as we say, you know, it's uh, you don't have to play optimally. That's how you. No. That's how you, you know, refine the fun out of a game. Also, maybe you're like uh, role-playing, as your Joker just really likes baseball. There you go. And my main protagonist of Persona 3 really likes eating out, apparently. Excuse me. Uh, Excuse me. Definitely not Car Azen, dot, 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 so maybe there's more to that name, gives $10. And says, Metal Gear Solid 5. The game is presented as an action game where stealth is not required, but the post-mission score somewhat su- somewhat suffers if you go loud or use some of the tools like the helicopter. I don't think Metal Gear Solid has ever presented itself as a not a stealth game. Uh, I think it's always like, like front-ended the stealth. Sure. Yeah, I mean, like arguably by the time... Uh, four came around it, it changed a little bit um but yeah yeah it's funny in, in terms of metal gear games like there's things i can think of in every metal gear game. like i love that series but there's things i can think of like the in metal gear solid one there's the sort of run back to get the sniper rifle where mm. like if you know what you're doing it's very quick to get the sniper rifle but if you don't know what you're doing you're like fucking where do i go to get this thing yeah um, yeah like the 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 big shell is kind of ugly and very samey in metal gear solid 2 like Every area is just that orange waste disposal plant. Um, oh, there you go. I don't know, Metal Gear Solid 3. Maybe escorting Ava, that one port near the end of the game. She's very mm. slow, and you need to just keep feeding her things as she bleeds out. 
It, listen, if you're escorting oh. someone and they're bleeding out, just keep feeding them. Goodies. Oh, Metal Gear, Sol- Metal Gear Solid Four, having to follow that dude in the European city. Oh God, yeah. While you're wearing that trench coat. Yeah, real bullshit. Yeah, I guess the another alternative title for this uh, stream would have been the one bit of the game where once you get to it, you decide you're done for the day and want to do something else. Black uh, flag trailing missions. The uh, I, I I replayed The Last of Us Part Two, and I don't maybe I don't know if this was in the original game or just added for. Uh, the uh the ps5 remaster or whatever but uh during any puzzle you could just pause and click skip puzzle and it'll just the it'll load an instance and the puzzle is solved and you could just move on and i'm like well this is nice and because i got there because it was one of those things where i was doing the puzzle correctly but the game wasn't acknowledging what i was like it was kind of physics that you had to like throw a rope in a specific place and i kept throwing the rope because that's where i thought it would be and the rope just like kind of glitched out and came back and so then i assumed that wasn't what i was supposed to do and it just turns out i wasn't being precise enough and so i don't like it when a game when i like mentally say okay this can't be the solution uh in a in a scenario where oh it is the solution i just was slightly off in how i was doing it uh fox d gives five dollars and says ai traffic in realistic city stroke highway driving games they drive like idiots i'm not sure whether that's annoying or just realistic See, I don't mind yeah. that in something like a GTA, because I feel mm. like part of the challenge of a GTA game is getting to the places you need to be, mm-hmm. and uh, getting there in traffic without causing a massive pileup or crashing into a police car, and having to uh, go on a huge tangent trying to avoid the cops for half an hour before you can get back to what you were trying to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's in the South, it's pretty realistic. Terrible drivers. I was raised there, awful drivers. Everyone's excited to get the cracker, bro. Yeah. <laughs> but, and then there's LA, where yeah. there's no public transport and everyone drives like a maniac. Mm. Uh, ah, gives one ninety nine and says, now say something nice about your least favorite game. Oh, I did that in the last semi emblematic actually. I said Wolfenstein Youngblood had a scene early on where they killed a Nazi and then threw up, and I thought that was kind of fun. I thought that opening cutscene of... Uh... Oh, what's the bad? What's the bad Half Life fan thing? Uh, Hunt, Hunt the Freeman. Down the Freeman. Opening cutscene. They put some work into. They put a little elbow grease into that opening cutscene. Cutscenes are just about the only thing they put any work yeah. into. Yeah. Ask me. Oh. Um, was it Last Hero of Nostalgia? They um did that thing where if you if you find an item like in, in Souls games, it has like a sort of riddle ish kind of thing of where you can go and activate the memory, and this activates the weapon and upgrades it. Which oh, I'm like, that should just be a thing any Souls game has. Yeah, but but yeah. that should be a thing in games that aren't bad. Yeah. <laughs> Alex Armstrong gets $2 and says, Wind Waker Sailing's the worst. Come at me, Yards. Wow. No, it isn't, Alex Armstrong. Counterpoint. Uh, no, you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Cesar Espinosa gives five pens. Ooh, I need a pen. I like to write on paper with them. And says, I'd love to hear you guys discuss silent protagonists as a topic. Who did it well and what even can be considered a silent protagonist? Love the show. Oh, well, uh, I did an extra punctuation back from who with the escapist on that very topic. Look at that. Maybe, okay. Perhaps that could uh, hold you over for now. I just generally don't like silent protagonists. Really? I think yes. like their, their era is kind of over. You just played a game where the, silent, the protagonist was silent. No, 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 no. But things aren't talking to me. I don't mind yeah. my being yeah. a character in a world. I don't mind being Samus and not talking in Super Metroid because I'm not trying to communicate sure. with things. Okay. This was something I went over in my video, actually. It's Fair only enough. really a yeah. silent protagonist if the character is silent as a deliberate artistic choice in a world mm. where other characters can talk and are interacting with them. Yeah. We're talking about our Gordon Freemans, our Lynx. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Jay Pando 27 gives $2 and says, Arkham Asylum Riddler trophies. Ooh, Jay Pando 27. I'm going to have to refute you there. I've been replaying the Arkham games recently, partly because I just like, once I've finished all the uh, serious superhero bollocks, just unwinding and uh, going on a trophy hunt with a podcast on. Yeah, it's one of my favorite the, parts of playing those games. Seems like um, that's not like an auxiliary feature, isn't it? It's like hating the think- flags in Assassin's Creed. I think Riddler trophies were improved in the sequels because they become they were more about puzzle challenges. In yeah. Arkham Asylum, they're mostly just randomly hidden in spots. Yeah and, yeah. and the last time I played through it, like I had three Riddler trophies left and they were all 
find the last chattering joker teeth in the middle of this level. Oh, this, that's this annoying room. as hell. This area, this area, and this area. And I was like, I'm not going to fucking do that. Yeah, yeah. I've already seen the ending you get when you find all the Riddler trophies. I'm just going to say I'm done. <laughs> yeah, the best thing an open world game like that could do is is pepper the map with little little puzzles you got to solve. I love that, like the little shrines yeah. in Breath of the Wild, little. And you can do little extra puzzles. challenges to unlock like their locations on the map, so yeah. it's not just you know blindly hunting for stuff mm-hmm. in Arkham City onwards. Uh, the Piss Bandit gives five dollars and says, "Surprise! Nobody's brought up Pokemon yet. Over a decade of three D Pokemon, and they're still more lifeless and ugly than Gen Five sprites." This is well, I mean, the worst just thing about favorite series. games. Yeah. yeah. I, I will say, uh, even the, the Pokemon, the earlier Pokemon games that I really like, uh, I think uh, the sort of the idea of HMs got annoying. Uh, HMs were uh, moves you could teach your Pokemon that also you needed to explore the world. So like to destroy a boulder, to enter a cave, or to be able to surf and s- swim across lakes. Uh, but those moves took up slots, and your characters only had four move slots. So you might need to like have one of your Pokemon be like I think they're referred to as like HM slaves, where it's like this is a Pokemon I'm not using for battle. I'm just teaching all of these things, and so we just pull them out to break rocks and to s- cut grass <laughs> and swim across lakes. What is my purpose? <laughs> what is my purpose in life? That's what Chadley was was created for. It's like grim life for an ambitious Pokemon. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, Palash Teague is one ninety nine and says encumbrance as a concept, especially Bethesda RPGs. All right. Sure. If there's if there's no strategy involved, if there's really no point to it, yeah, it, it feels I, redundant. I'm annoyed by encumbrance if it doesn't become an issue until like you're six hours into the game and you try to pick up something, and the game says no, you have finally reached the limit, and now you're gonna have to pick a hundred million things to throw away. I, w- I wouldn't mind it so much if it was like a small encumbrance, and uh, you which you hit pretty quick, so it was always something you were dealing with. Oh, yeah, see, it's, suddenly, it's when it sneaks up on you that it annoys me. Oh, uh, well, like a skull and bones, where it's like, fuck, now I gotta throw out some planks. Whereas you'd prefer to just, like, all right, you can either take this bowling ball or this boulder. You can have both. Yeah. Like if they front load it at the start, sure. Yeah. Well, and make, uh, make it an actual core mechanic you have to think about. Like a Silent Hill 4, you've only got like eight, eight inventory stot slots and bullets don't stack for some yeah. stupid reason. Yeah, if you make it matter from the start, sure. If it's later in the game, like I was yeah. like, I'm almost done. Why now? <laughs> also, just pull a Resi and just let me do let me do Tetris inventory puzzles. Pull a Dredge. Mm. That's the only encumbrance uh, I want. Spatial encumbrance. Eric Whitecat gives fifty asses. Oh, hi, Eric. Uh, again, you know you can just talk to us, right? But it's his so not- anniversary. No, he says it. that everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lie. I'm liking it. it. Says- not being able to craft with materials in your inventory in Animal Crossing, forcing you to grab these, or that you can only do one item at a time. Yeah, crafting one thing at a time if you want to craft a batch is incredibly fucking annoying in any game. Yeah. yeah. And also it being like, oh no, you need to have these things on you, it won't just pull from your inventory. I like that, at least in Dragon's Dogma, like all the shit you leave at the inn or put in chests, when you yeah. go to craft something, it will still acknowledge that all that stuff is part of your crafting. I like a game like Minecraft or Stardew. Where when you craft when you're going to like the crafty shop or whatever, it it accounts for everything that's in your base. Yes, and not just what you got in your pockets. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Armonia one ninety nine pounds. Sorry, I'm, I'm I, my my brain cells aren't connecting up the way they used to. <clears throat> oh no. Armonia gives one ninety nine pounds and says, "Any game with microtransactions, obviously." Armonia, that's not the game we're playing. What game do you love? But do microtransactions stick out? I mean, that, that I happened to me. Too, with I, bunch, like I played Smite for ten years, but it was it was the decisions they made with money at the start of the game that ended up impacting it later in the game. So stuff mm-hmm. that you wouldn't anticipate. That's why uh, today's cold take is about just monetization in general because a lot of these problems you don't see until like way later on so you kind of want to get them right the first time yeah uh z drake gives 199 and says zelda gets free passes where other games het bashed oh get bashed i think he mistyped yeah i don't know know like we've been giving it a few bashes today yeah every game gets a gets a bash or two 
Yeah. Super Bash Bros. Dr. Thea gives $5. It says, Half-Life 2 feels like an amusement park ride where everything revolves around you. Everyone knows and loves you, and it feels like I'm in a play. You know what it feels like to me? There was an old Australian improv comedy show on TV called Thank God You're Here, where they'd got <laughs> improv comedians on, and their job was to walk, in, walk through a door into a room, and there'd be a set with other characters already set up. And the first thing another character would say is, Thank God You're Here, and then they just have to go along with the scene. Oh, a lot of this cutscenes in Half-Life remind me of that. Mm-hmm. that's how i feel in any like oh you're the main protagonist the last of us same it's like oh it's good you're here it's like cool i'm gonna get shot yeah. <laughs> so, and so are you chances are uh sean harriman member for four months in the green gang says lack of impactful choices in cyberpunk i.e gangs yeah was, that's again a slippery slope if like you start introducing choices you're like oh well, well where does how deep does this choice rabbit hole go yeah, like again, d- p- jumping off of Last of Us, the the ending, a lot of people were really upset because it's like, where's my player choice? Where's my agency? I was like, well, you didn't really have that much to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Everyone wants fucking ending Tron three thousand endings or something. Beep, boop. I just don't want to be the bad guy, Yahtzee. <laughs> well, that was the point, surely, not to defend the Last of Us. I don't like that it made the point with me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. This is not me. Uh, Luisa Azul gives ten R dollars and says, "I still find funny how Yarts think Persona Five has the best story out of all the Persona games, and Three has a mess story. Meanwhile, the fandom unanimously agree Five has the worst story, and Three has the best. Oh, well, I guess yeah. I'm in trouble Wait, since fandom. opinion since correctness is decided by majority opinion now. Ain't no fandom <laughs> unanimous. It turns like <laughs> Al Qaeda, ISIS, they have factions." Absolutely yeah. not. It's like the Diablo community where the fandom loves three or two based on who yeah. you're talking to. Yeah. Lou says, all, you think five has the worst story and three has the best. That's what I'm, you meant. I'm telling you, every fan refuses to acknowledge that other people exist. It is, it is baffling. Fucking parasocials. I think, that Persona, is barren. I think Persona 4 is an incredibly good game. What about Persona okay. 1? Persona 1's kind of fucking gunky. <laughs> no one cares about Persona before they added waifus. That's true. Persona 1 and what? 2 and 2 again. No waifus. Get me out of here. What's in them, then? What are you romancing? You're not romancing anything. You're just hunting demons. Yeah. Everything's there's fucked. No, there's, no, there's none of the life sim element of Persona 3 yeah. onwards. That's that's my kind of game. A, oh. Yeah, you would probably like those, because it's like more <laughs> of like a crunchy dungeon crawler. There you yeah. go. Uh, Reddish Baron gives two Canadian dollars and says Fort Condor in Final Fantasy VII original. Yeah, the Fort Condor. Well, I've only stuff. I've only played Rebirth. How'd you like Fort Condor and Rebirth? Huh? Like getting into uh, that Condor? Scroll. Remind remind me which bit was Fort Condor. I think it was a mini game, so you might not have needed to do it uh, as a side quest. It's where you get uh, tra- isekai inside of the video game, where you have to do sort of like a tower defense thing. It's one of the. Oh uh, no, I don't think I got as far as that. Okay, I mean you can. They're just completely optional in all the areas. So, okay, there you go. Uh, Fat Bot Slim gives thirty-five zars and says, "Dishonored, you are a professional assassin, but don't kill anyone, or you get the bad ending." I don't think that game ever goes out and says you're a professional assassin. Yeah, it's just occupation, right? Also, the key, the key point of assassination (laughs) is that assassination is about targeted surgical strikes on key targets. Yeah. If you kill everyone, you're not an assassin, you're just a spree killer. That's true. But, you know, you are the Queen's guard, and you fail miserably right at the start. Well, that's why you had to get a new job as an assassin. No, like, the beginning of Dishonored, what was it? You're like a bodyguard or something, and immediately get framed because you're wearing a gimp suit or something. You're wearing a gimp suit? Are you talking about Jose and Corvo? The, he's got the oh, ball he... gag on, he just won't say, oh, it wasn't me. <laughs> You don't me. wear. You're not wearing a gimp suit from the start. You're just no, a silent yeah, no. protagonist. No, yeah. we were wearing gimp suits as we were playing the game. I thought this was one of those silent protagonist immersive things. <laughs> they told it me it was nice. haptic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe you were. Anyway, Humane Shield gets one ninety nine and says slime tethering the stone cupids in Ghostbusters. You know the Ghostbusters video game from like the PS3 era was surprisingly involved and surprisingly good. Oh, mm. I never played it. Although this feels like a, a phrase you would use to um, like trigger a Manchurian candidate. 
slime tethering the stone cupids in Ghostbusters PS3? Yeah, I don't specifically remember that. I remember the slime tethering being a thing. Boston makes me feel good, everybody. <laughs> We're so close to that. Uh, really <clears excited. throat> <laughs> yeah, they really have to think hard to come up with alternative weapons in Ghostbusters besides just shooting thing with laser a lot. Ghostbusting like Blade? If you like. Mm. I would love. Uh, Estefan Costa gives $5 and says, Before stream ends, a shout out to all of you for Second Wind generally. I like all the work. Ramblematic, cold, take, bite, size, etc. Thanks. My You're welcome, Estefan Costa. You're a true fan. And only true fans like every bit of content that something puts out. Oh, Wait a minute. That was, that's the opposite of what we've been talking about. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to see a lot of us together in one place at one time, tune in in 90 minutes to our Ground Branch stream. Oh, shit. We better wrap this up so we can have my breach, fucking lunch. Breach. Breach. Uh, Jpanda27 gives $5 and says, To be fair, I always thought it was funny to imagine the Riddler running around and hiring contractors to hide those things around Gotham. Oh, you think that this was one of those things where he was just like, he was just sort of the brains of the operation and other goons were actually placing them there? Well, well, we know that's what's happening because that's that whole mechanic in Arkham City where you beat up Riddler's, Riddler's henchmen. And then he gives you all the stuff. They tell them where they hid all the, the, the puzzles that they personally mm. hid. Don't, you shouldn't, don't employ snitches. Part one. Uh, Louisa Azul gives five R dollars and says, not saying you're wrong, just thought it was weird how everyone I meet loved three the most. I know a lot of people well, who maybe like you, four, and, four and five. Maybe, maybe you exclusively hang out with weirdos, Louisa Azul. No, you ever think of that? not weirdos. I think it's just emo. I bet it's an age. It's I wonder if everyone's Persona is just yeah. what, what sub-generation you it's are. It's on their Tinder settings. Must like Persona 3. Must like five. Ethan. Must Strange, like dogs. I keep meeting Persona 3 lovers, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I think your favorite Persona story is just whichever one you played first. Mm. Yeah, maybe. That's been my experience. Yeah. Uh, well, that's it. Well, that's all the Super Chats. I'm so so uh, thanks for listening. I was Yahtzee Croshaw. That was Marty and that was Frost. Uh, and as, he, as Marty just said, yes, we'll all be back in about 90 minutes playing Ground Breach. Uh, in a big old crossover stream with like oh, like eight of us, it'll be crazy. Ground branch, it's ground branch breaching is what we're, we're gonna be breaching. doing. Yeah. We're oh, ourselves damage. breach babies. Ground branch. Well, ground breach makes more sense as a title. They, no, they it's called ground board. branch, and we're the breach babies. But we're not gonna call oh. ourselves the breach babies on the stream. This is just this is we're just referring to ourselves Earths. as the breach babies. Yeah, I was a breach baby. Shout out to breach babies. Really? I don't know what I was. You say clearly? <laughs> <laughs> clearly you were born upside down with the umbilical cord <laughs> choking you. I think the doctor told my mom I was dead. <laughs> well, you yeah, shouldn't tell that to like a woman who just gave birth. Because I wasn't dead. I'm right here. I got a bunch of problems, but I'm not dead. <laughs> what else we got going on? <laughs> oh, uh, well, as I was saying, fully emblematic this week is on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I think that'll be a fun one. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, Yahtzee tries as well the same day. Uh, that's it for my content this week, I think. We don't have a semi around this week. What else no. have we got? We have the big Thursday stream as well. You're going to be seeing a lot of, you're going to be sick of us by the end of this. By the end oh, of shit. Time. I forgot. I'm on the Thursday stream as well. Because we're doing so much. like a big an old day, an all day stream. A bunch of us will be doing different things. It'll be the return of Dokapon. The Dokapon stroke upon continues. Maybe the closure? I don't Maybe know. the closure. Who knows? No no way we end that in four hours. I don't. I, do, I really have to go back and rewatch those old videos to figure out what was going on. Also, also, the return of some lethal company, which we haven't played on stream yeah. in quite a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, Frost, you have a new cold take today, correct? Yep. New cold take came out talking about monetization. You can't get too fancy with the spices. You know, you might, might lose the flavor, might, might make a different flavor you weren't expecting. Who knows? I might turn into Conan O'Brien and just go nuts because you got nice. too much spice up in you. Poor boy. Oh, yeah. Poor boy. That's it. All right. Everyone, all everyone go hang out at the Ground Branch landing page. And yes. we're all going to be Ground. there. We're all going to be there in 90 Ground. minutes. Ground Branch. They're paying us money and I got their name wrong. No, you're oh, doing that's fine. Gonna you're be doing a... fine. You oh, get it wrong on this amazing. stream, get it right on that stream. Think about that. Okay. This is a little sloppy copy. Maybe I'll just insist on 
continually calling it the wrong name just to make it part of my individual quirky personality. There you go. All right, bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Here we go. See you soon.